Um, so uh, for everyone who's on, uh, Mean Harati is uh, the director of the, the men's health and infertility practices down there at Johns Hopkins. He did his undergraduate at the University of Missouri, trained at LIJ, did a fellowship with uh, Dory and uh, Lipschultz there at, at Baylor, and uh, is going to talk to us today about medical and surgical practice for scrotal pain. Again, grateful to Phil Lee for, for reaching out to you to uh, have you speak about this very common and vexing problem. Thank you so much. So I, I have a lot of mentors in the Zoom session right now. One thing that isn't in my profile or my CV is that I did a seven month research fellowship with Dr. Paduk and Dr. Schlegel when I was at LIJ. And so they were gracious enough to have me over during my research block. And so I was very involved in the, the research arm and I worked with Dr. Lee as a resident there. And then I had the short experience of working with you guys and it was very influential in deciding what path I was gonna go down for fellowship. So from that, I had the exposure to basic science research and then Dr. Lamb came to me as a, another fortuitous mentor along the path. So I, I definitely connected with a lot of people at Cornell and I'm very fortunate for that. Okay. But thank you again for having me. Okay, so one thing that has been a key interest of mine that led me to the field of urology as a medical student was the management of pelvic pain. And I had a mentor in LIJ, I have a lot of mentors. And one of them was at LIJ and he's, his name is Rob Moldwin. And he's a, an interstitial cystitis guru. And many of you probably know him. And as a medical student, I was working with him on a lot of his clinical research projects. And I found a lot of them to be so fascinating and the field so underserved. And so as a medical student, I had this inclination towards pain but I didn't want to pursue that as the career path, but it was always an interest of mine. And then as I went through residency, as I went through fellowship, my interest in pain has grown and grown and grown. So hopefully this is a good summary for you guys to be able to take away from. And with that, uh, I do have some disclosures. I'm a consultant to a company called Daddy, and I also uh, am a consultant to Teleflex, but neither one of these companies have had any influence on the talk and there's no relevant uh, disclosure for these. So the main objective of this talk is, and the thing that I really want you guys to take away from this is that as a urologic field, we really need to step back from seeing people as a condition and then offering them an algorithm of treatment options. Because the problem is very simple. And if you take the field of pelvic pain, specifically scrotal pain, and you think about the anatomy of the condition, it's actually very simple. And the term idiopathic pain should really not exist if you think about the anatomy, the, specifically the neuroanatomy. So we're going to review that. And then also we're going to go over some of the medical surgical therapies and the outcomes associated with each. So for those who are unfamiliar with chronic scrotal pain, the condition is referred to as chronic whenever it's lasting more than three months. And it accounts for a significant number of visits annually, but it's estimated 2.5 to 5% of urologic visits, but this is probably an underestimate. Likely there are more uh, cases that are occurring that just do not reach our attention and are not coming to our awareness. And if we look at the rates of idiopathic scrotal pain, it's estimated to be 25 to 50% of cases are deemed idiopathic. When really, if you look at the the patient's history, you can identify a condition that led to that pain. And I would argue that probably less than 5% of these cases are truly idiopathic. Whenever I see a patient with scrotal pain, I always go down to the basics. I ask about the patient's history. What happened when the pain started? Oftentimes you can trace it back to a sentinel event. So if the patient had a vasectomy, hernia repair, infection, that can guide you to the organ of interest. If they had a hernia repair, the problem won't be in the scrotum. The problem will be more in the inguinal canal, which is obvious to say, but that gets missed a lot. You wanna know about how long they've had the pain, about the severity. Another key finding with the history is the direction of referred pain. The referred pain pathway can narrow down the area of injury with very good accuracy. So if somebody's telling you that their pain is posterior scrotal, goes to the perineal area, goes to their back or the rectal area, 
that's going to lead you down the pudendal nerve pathway and organs that pudendal nerve innervates. If the pain is along the anterior spermatic cord and goes up the inguinal canal, then that's going to lead you down to a different nerve pathway. So the direction of referred pathway is extremely important in order to understand the location of the pain and what is actually causing the pain. You also want to know about exacerbating ameliorating factors. If they lie down and their pain discomfort gets better, then that could suggest a varicose heal. So understanding what makes it better makes it worse is really key. And also the prior surgeries in scrotum, inguinal canal, and the abdomen are extremely, extremely, extremely important. And too often we gloss over the surgeries that patients have had outside of our domain and we ignore the inguinal scar the patient has. And that unfortunately is a common finding for a lot of these guys with idiopathic pain. On the exam, it's a focused GU exam. I have the patient stand and repeat the exam supine. I always examine the non-painful site first because if I trigger their pain at the onset, then they're gonna be guarding for the rest of the exam. And then I try to localize the pain. I try to identify whether the pain is over the spermatic cord, over the epididymis, I do a rectal exam to assess their pelvic floor, but the most important thing is I try to reproduce the pain. If I can reproduce the pain, then I can identify where the pain is. And that is gonna be a key driver for a lot of the outcomes. In addition, uh, there's the option of imaging. However, imaging is usually not helpful. So the only time a spurtal ultrasound is important is A, for litigation reasons to document that there was an abnormality, but also for the true purpose of diagnostic testing, if you can perform an exam, such as body habitus, if there's a limitation from the body habitus, then you can use an ultrasound in order to identify the abnormality. But oftentimes, if you can pinpoint the location of the pain and reproduce on the exam, the ultrasound is really not necessary. In complex cases where there's been prior pelvic surgery, such as prostatectomy, radiation for prostate cancer, Getting an MRI can be really helpful because it can identify potential neuropathy of the pudendal nerve, but also there are other conditions that can evade us, and these are conditions outside of the GU system, such as spinal dysraphism. I've seen a number of guys with Tarlov cysts, which are perineural cysts, and these are what these cysts look like, and they can involve the sacral roots. So if you see a patient that has spurtal pain and they've gone through the full gamut of somatic cord block, even more targeted nerve blocks and not responding. If you get an MRI, you may find some of these abnormalities that may be subtle. And also the patients with the history of spinal stenosis, T12 to L2, and also S2 to S4 distribution. If you see one of these nerve roots affected, then that can be a key reason for why the patient may have pain. Now, if we look at the different conditions that lead to chronic scrotal pain, this was Dr. Jarvie, who is a very active, a member of our society who looks at chronic scrotal pain and studies it and has a clinic dedicated to it. So in his study where he looked at 131 men who had scrotal pain for at least 18 months or had 18 months on average, their duration of pain was four and a half and seven tenths of a year. And three quarters of these patients could not perform their activities of daily living. 50% couldn't work at all. And 61% were not sexually active due to their pain. The number of other chronic Pain conditions were also present, such as IBS, fibromyalgia. And if we look at the conditions that led to these guys with chronic spurtal pain that were deemed idiopathic, vasectomy was identified in about 20% of them. A trauma of some sort was identified in about 12%. And then infection, hernia repair, epidemic cysts, and others uh, were also identified. Now, I would argue in my practice, I see hernia repair, epididymal cysts as a much more common reason for chronic scrotal pain, especially when deemed idiopathic. If we look at the anatomy, the epididymis is at fault 53% of the time. The testicular pain or calgis isolate to the testis about a quarter of a percent of the time, and then along the vast deference, the, the rest. So when reviewing scrotal anatomy, this was something that Dr. Goldstein had impressed upon me in, in learning about the vasoepi and also Dr. Lee. The anatomy of the epididymis is really helpful in understanding why some of these guys get the pain that they get. The caput epididymis is fed by multiple ductuli afferentes. So whenever epididymal obstruction occurs, more proximal pressure develops and cysts and spermatoceles can form. So the way I equate this to patients, I tell them that if a garden hose kinks, the pressure above it builds and you get this distended tubule that can be very painful. 
Surgery in this area is also less likely to result in epididymal obstruction due to the redundancy of the ductuli and pharynxes. So that's the first third. And then the caput epididymis is fed uh, by the ductuli and pharynxes, and those drain into the corporate epididymis and the cauda epididymis. And those form into a singular tube that when obstruction occurs, it results in obstructive testis and you get much more pressure within the system. But you have more redundancy in the caput epididymis than you do in the corporate cauda. When we consider the innervation of the scrotum, this is the part that really changed my view and understanding of, of pain when I came to Hopkins. There's a peripheral nerve surgeon at Hopkins named Lee Dellen, and he and I stumbled upon uh, each other's paths whenever I was a first year faculty member, and he helped me take a step back from GU approach to more of a holistic approach, considering the patient and other organ systems. And one of the things that he impressed upon me was that the options for managing pain really rests upon the nerves that lead into the scrotum. So taking some time to review this is basic, but very helpful and informative. So when we think about the scrotum and the anatomy of the scrotum, the ilioinguinal nerve, and we'll go over each of these nerves more specifically, will target the anterior and typically along the upper thirds of the spermatic cord up into the middle canal. The gentofemoral nerves will be more on the lateral aspects of the spermatic cord and along the anterior third of the thigh, its lateral side. The pudendal nerve fibers will be posterior scrotal, and the iliohypogastric nerve will feed into more of a suprapubic distribution. So we'll go over each of these nerves. But in addition to the peripheral nerves that go into the scrotum, there are a lot of autonomic nerves that also feed in. So we have three sets or three branches of the autonomic plexus that feed in. We've got the superior spermatic nerves, the middle spermatic nerves, and the inferior spermatic nerves. So these uh, autonomic nerves will arise from the inferior hypogastric plexus, and they'll innervate the spermatic cord and also carry a lot of the autonomic nerve fibers that will have afferent fibers carrying pain within them. So when we look at the ilioingual nerve, these are pictures of procedures I have performed with Dr. Dellen. The ilioingual nerve is a branch T12 to L2. So if you think about the distribution of the nerve, as I mentioned, it sits over the anterior spermatic cord and goes along the inguinal canal. And it's distinct from the genitofemoral branches, gentle branch of the genitofemoral nerve in that it's more anterior and more of an inguinal rather than inguinal ring to lateral aspects. So here we can see the ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric nerve before their bifurcation. This is about two finger breaths medial to ASIS and about two uh, finger breaths below ASIS. So you can identify this bifurcation in patients and perform selective neurectomy. The genitofemoral nerve, as I mentioned, is another contributor to spermatic cord pain and also orchalgia. The genital branch of the genital femoral nerve will run along the lateral aspects of the scrotum, and the femoral branch will run along the anterior thigh. So here's a picture of the spermatic cord pulled medially, and you can identify the genital fiber of the genital femoral nerve as it long, runs along the lateral aspects. Also, the pudendal nerve will have innervation within the scrotum. The, <clears throat> excuse me, the perineal branches of the pudendal nerve will innervate the prostate. And at the bifurcation of the perineal nerves at the Alcox Canal, there are also uh, fibers that lead to the penis, the dorsal nerve, or the clitoris and penis. But the perineal nerve is what branches off and gives rise to the posterior scrotal nerves. So in some cases where you see guys with pelvic floor dysfunction, this is the nerve that is being affected by pelvic floor dysfunction. So it's, and it's the perineal nerve branch of the pudendal nerve. So this was a, a paper from 1994 from Dr. Sears in Lancet, who identified patients that had pain that lasted about one to seven years. Fantastic. I must be so psyched to be on this side of it. What he noticed was that when he oh, administered a periplastatic block, that a lot of these patients had substantial relief of their pain and their pain scores decreased from 6.4 on the AVS scale to, the, uh, to 0 0.2. So they get a significant reduction in their pain. And unexpectedly from this injection, they had improved urinary symptoms. They had better flow 
and less stress urinary incontinence in 20% of the patients. So this is something that we'll come back to in a minute about why there is an overlap between urinary symptoms and, and nerve blocks. But the key takeaway is that when you consider the autonomic nerves, there is contribution of these nerve fibers to orcalgin and scrotal pain and something that is to be considered if you do selective nerve blocks of the ileolingual, iliohypogastric, gentacarmal nerve, and they're not getting better, this is the nerve root that's probably contributing. Dr. Sijo Paracatil in 2013 did an important study looking at 57 tissue biopsies obtained at the time of a cord denervation in 56 patients. He did H and E staining and looked for evidence of Wallerian degeneration, which is an autodestructive change in the proximal distal nerve roots that occurs at the time of peripheral nerve injury. So when he analyzed the biopsies, he identified that the premasseric nerve fibers were the most dense as far as having nerve fibers. On average, there was 19 nerve fibers per patient. And he identified Wallerian degeneration about 33 to 67% of them. The next most common location that he identified was a perivasal tissue in the vasal sheath. He identified about nine nerves with 63% of those nerves having Wallerian degeneration. And then in the posterior fat of the scrotum and lipomus tissue, he identified about three nerves. So there are some groups that advocate for when performing a denervation, just going after these three areas with pretty good success rates, but we'll talk about those outcomes in a moment. The limitation of the study was that they looked at Wallerian degeneration as a marker of nerve damage. And this isn't something that we always see as the key finding for nerves with neuropathic pain within them. And there are patients that I've operated on at Hopkins with Lee Dellen who have had brachytherapy and whenever their pudental nerve was identified as a culprit nerve, we did stains on them to see whether or not there was evidence of learning degeneration. There was no sign whatsoever. And that's despite radiation, injury, and fibrosis. So learning degeneration is a driver of pain and neuropathic pain. But because you see it doesn't mean that it's the cause of pain. If you don't see it, it doesn't mean that the nerve wasn't the cause of the pain. But the key takeaway from this is that there are three areas that are the densest for these nerve fibers. Regarding the medical therapies that are available, uh, the key feature of these medications is that for patients to do reasonably well with these medical therapies, they have to have a neuropathic etiology to their pain. So if you give somebody who has an epididymal cyst medications for neuropathic pain, you haven't really done them a service and you've exposed them to a lot of unnecessary medications that may not really help them. So in the class of medical therapies and options, there's gabapentin pregabalin, and the mechanism of action for these is really poorly understood. There's central activity and peripheral activity. We think more about the peripheral activity where these medications can bind to the presynaptic voltage-gated calcium channels and dorsal hernia of the spinal cord, and that interferes with the pain transmission from the injured peripheral nerves. But also, the addition of these medications can enhance the inhibitory input of the GABA pathways and that lowers the threshold of pain perceived by the cortex. So there's multi-level uh, pain control for these patients. And when you look at the differences between gabapentin and pregabalin, the differences between two is that 75% of patients will experience at least 50% improvement in their pain with gabapentin versus 40% with pregabalin. So between the two of these, gabapentin is better than pregabalin. Now, another class of medications that also helps with neuropathic pain is nortripline and elevil or amitripline. The mechanism of action is that they inhibit norepinephrine and serotonin of the first and second order neurons. And when you compare the outcomes between nortripline and uh, gabapentin, there are studies that have looked at this, all, albeit small retrospective studies, that have looked at the outcome. And one study in particular is one from Sinclair in 2007, where you had looked at 26 patients with idiopathic chronic scrotal pain who had failed conservative therapies. And when he compared gabapentin to nortriptyline, he identified that 67% of patients had reported greater than 50% improvement in their pain versus only 61% with gabapentin. So comparing these two classes of medications, nortriptyline does seem to have a better profile. So if a patient has a spermatic cord block and they respond well to it, what are the options for that point that are not surgical? So a patient with a good response, one option that we offer them is to just come back for serial nerve blocks. And sometimes we add Kinelog to the injection and that can reduce their pain. I've had some patients where just the simple cord block was the thing that resolved their pain. And I'm not sure why 
that occurred, but they had a, a more proximal nerve block and potentially the hydrodissection along the nerve root re released the nerve, quieted the nerve. Whatever the mechanism, some of these guys do get prolonged pain relief, and that can be a key driver in their quality of life and alleviating their pain. Botox has been looked at as an option, but Dr. Jarvie basically put this one to rest when he did a randomized control trial back in April that showed no benefit for Botox injection. And another exciting option that is not in our domain, but something that we should be aware of, is that there's the option of pulsed RFA. And whenever we have identified nerves for the neuropathic pain, such as iliuminal, iliohypogastric, genital femoral nerves, if you can apply radiofrequency ablation to those, you can get complete pain relief. And that's a durable as long as the RFA is working. So to take this back to a patient and to understand what this means in the context of a patient that we may see in our clinics, this is an index patient who underwent a vasectomy in 2015. He had bilateral pain, left greater than right. And the pain started three to four weeks after his vasectomy. He described the discomfort as a baseline annoyance, but it was affecting his quality of life. It was waking him up from sleep. And anytime he would have intercourse, it would increase the pain to six out of 10. Not surprisingly, he had an unremarkable scrotal ultrasound by an outside hospital. And he had been given the routine options of non-steroidals, tricyclic antidepressants, and gabapentin without benefit. And his only past medical past surgical history relevant was the vasectomy. On exam, he had normal-sized testes, no varicose veins, no granulomas from his vasectomy. He had mid to high vasectomy sites bilaterally, and his epididymides were without cysts. But on palpation, his left epididymis was mildly indurated and tender to palpation, suggestive of congestive. So he underwent a bilateral somatic cord block. And the medication that I use in my clinic, although it's not the, the standard for cord blocks, or maybe Dr. Goldstein or actually will have a different uh, combination of medication that they use, but I use lidocaine 1% per side, 10 cc's. I isolate the somatic cord. I give anesthetic to the anterior aspects of somatic cord and also to the lateral aspects. And it helps me differentiate local from referred pain. So if a patient has relief of their pain with the somatic cord block, it tells me that with a little bit more certainty, but not complete certainty, that the pain is more distal to that cord block. If they don't respond to the cord block, it suggests that the pain may be coming from a more proximal location, suggesting more inguinal or spinal etiologies. The definition of a the positive block, from my perspective, is a 90% reduction in the pain for the duration of the block. And it's good to get a second cord block, just to confirm that the first one wasn't a placebo effect. But what are the limitations of the cord block? The limitations of the cord block is that whenever you're pushing in the anesthetic, you're getting broad dis dispersion of the anesthetic throughout the cord. So you're going to get all branches of the peripheral nerves and the autonomic nerve fibers quieted. And it really doesn't tell you with any accuracy what nerve is really being affected here. You could have all of them quiet or you may miss some of the branches. So it's not specific for any of the nerves in the spermatic cord and it can spread throughout the cord making it unreliable. But also false negatives are possible. If the needle for the spermatic cord doesn't get deep enough, then you won't get to the spermatic cord and you won't get a positive response. So when we think about post vasectomy pain syndrome, we estimate about one to 2% of the guys getting vasectomy will develop chronic scrotal pain. Now, a lot of the problems that develop post-vasectomy that can lead to chronic scrotal pain don't always lead to pain. And that's the interesting thing is which of the patients that we vasectomize will end up with pain and which ones won't. But it's estimated about one to 2% of them will develop chronic pain. It can occur months to years after the vasectomy. It can be from epididymal congestion, epididymal cyst formation, perineural fibrosis, leakage of the antigenic basal fluid, and also vascular stasis. And we can identify a number of conditions, and these are things that we counsel our patients about, about the risk of developing epididymitis, orchitis, epididymal cysts, bromatoceles, sperm granulomas, hematomas, and neuromas. But when we see these patients and they've gone through this, the gamut of the conservative measures and they've had a, a trial of six months without benefit, and we take them through the spermatic core block and they have a positive response to it, then we have a couple of different options that open up to us. We have options for operating on the epididymis, to doing the innervation, to do a reversal, and as a very last resort, orchiectomy. So if we consider the option for epididymectomy, what's the data behind that? So my perspective on epididymal surgery changed when I was in Houston. I, I, had, I pointed with an arrow. This is actually an image I took uh, recently. 
So I have a vulvar wrist ganglion. And I've had this for a long time, but it didn't bother me until I went to Houston. When I went to Houston, the cyst grew and it became extremely painful. So as I was working with Dr. Lipschultz in the OR, we noticed that I was developing significant wrist pain. So I went to a hand surgeon there and Dr. Lamb may recognize Dr. Netcher's name, but I went to a wrist surgeon and he said, oh, it's a cyst, it's under pressure. And if I drain it, the pain will go away. And sure enough, he put a needle, aspirated the fluid out, the cyst recurred, but it's no, no longer painful. So that ganglion cyst that I developed helped me understand that whenever a cyst forms in a tight compartment, that can lead to extreme pain. And that's a lead into epididymal cyst. So whenever we identify palpable abnormalities of the epididymis, we have to remember that the tunic albuginea over the epididymis is a confined compartment. So whenever you have cysts developing within the epididymis, they can put pressure on the nerve fibers in the area. So whenever we see epididymal cysts, it's something that we can target with a very good cure of pain. And I estimate patients to have a 50 to 90% based on the literature, and I'll, I'll present my data also for this. But this should only be offered to patients, epididymal surgery should only be offered to patients with a palpable abnormality. So if you palpate the epididymis and you can identify a nodule or a cyst, and that's reproducible whenever you palpate it, that patient should go for preferentially for epididymal surgery rather than a patient that has diffuse epididymal pain. The reason for that is if you operate on a patient with chronic epididymitis, the success rate for cure is zero to 24%. And there's a high rate of progression to orchiectomy, and there's a high rate of regret associated with these with a high rate of litigation associated. So this is something that uh, is in the Campbell's book as far as uh, things not to do. If you have somebody with chronic epididymitis, do not remove their epididymis. It has a very poor success rate and a high rate of progression to orchiectomy. So the disadvantages of an epididymectomy, it creates obstruction and the testis has nowhere to drain to. So you get a, a secondary obstruction in the testis and you get secondary orchitis. And also from the procedure, you can compromise the blood flow to the testis. Looking at <clears throat> my own experience for managing guys with epididymal cysts, many of these guys have come to me as a second, third, fourth, and one, one was a 10th opinion. And these guys were labeled idiopathic pain, many of these guys. Whenever I examined their scrotum, I identified palpable abnormalities within their scrotum and more specifically within their epididymis. And when I removed the epididymal cyst, I found from my own data set that about 80% of them were pain-free and 16% were improved. Another patient has persistence of pain, but he also has another epididymal cyst that has formed. So I'm confident that if I go after that remaining epididymal cyst, that I'll improve the pain-free rate even higher than 80%. So this is my data, and it parallels well with other studies that have looked at removal of painful epididymal cysts. So Padmore 1996 found that when he operated on 25 patients, that three quarters of them had pain-free rates. And then Kelleri et al. in 2009, again, three quarters of these patients had uh, pain-free rates of three quarters, 75%. So on average, about three quarters of patients will have cure of their pain from just a simple epididymal cyst excision. About 10% of them will be improved and the others will have no change. But a lot of these guys that came to see me had, had recommendations to have a cord innervation. Some have been told orchiectomy and some have been told there's nothing I can do for you. So whenever you see these guys, you really have to look at the exam and you really have to reproduce the pain. If you can identify the pain, you have so many options that are simple and are not going to put the testis at risk or remove the testis, I should say. So denervation is an option, and it's something that we as urologists are sometimes a little quick to recommend because it's in our wheelhouse. So if we look at microsurgical denervation, this was first described by Devine and Shellhammer in 1978 with the goal of preserving the testis and treating orchalgia, again, of idiopathic etiology. The concept of it is that you divide all the structures leaving the artery and lymphatics, and some will take the vas and some will spare the vas. But when you take all the structures except those, then you can have a pretty significant improvement in their pain. This is typically done through a subliminal approach. The genital femoral nerve is ligated as it exits the ring. And here's a picture of the spermatic cord 
uh, showing the uh, residual arteries and lymphatics and the vast deference that's been left intact. And this is from Larry Levine's paper. So if you look at the outcomes of these patients, the largest studies have shown that the, and the one is uh, Collects Day et al. from 2018, uh, where they had studied 700 patients. But for the most part, when you look at the uh, percent of patients that are pain-free, improved, or not changed, when you look at their aggregate data, 70% of patients will have uh, pain-free rates, about 20% will be improved, and 10% will have no change. But a key limitation in these studies is when you look at the follow-up, it's only 22 months of follow-up. And we know that whenever you operate on the nerves, there are some changes that can occur that can lead to recurrence of pain. So at the site where the nerve transection occurs, you can get neuromas. And those, that same neuroma formation can occur at the dorsal root ganglia. So there are neurotrophic factors that can change within dorsal ganglia that can lead to chronic regional pain syndrome. And some of those arise from peripheral nerve surgeries. So transecting nerves and operating nerves should really be the second to last option, in my opinion. And if you ask me how many times I've done a cord denervation at Hopkins, zero. I'm yet to do a cord denervation, even though I'm microsurgically trained to do so. One exciting option that is something that came from Cornell with uh, Dr. Goldstein, Dr. Schlegel, and Dr. Lee is the option for multi-photon microscopy. And I'm, I'm really excited for this to, to be available for patients because whenever we look at selective neurectomy, identifying the nerve from fascial fibers can be very difficult. And in some cases we can identify nerve fibers and then we find out after the fact by pathology that it wasn't nerve fiber at all. So having the option of multi-photon microscopy is really exciting. And for those unfamiliar, the concept is that you have simultaneous absorption of two to three near infrared photons at low power. And this excites the nerve to identify them, but also you can use that same multi-photon microscopy to ablate the nerves as well. And this occurs without staining fixation. And just by simple increase of the laser power, you can lead to nerve ablation. So these are you know, the stains and H&E stains showing where the nerve fibers were, and also images from the multi-photon microscopy showing that the nerves that were identified were ablated successfully. So again, this is a, an exciting option because this is like the key reason why a lot of the guys that don't have a good response from the cord innervation have a persistence of pain is that they may have missed nerve fibers. And if this becomes prime time for patient use, then this is something that, um, can be used with good success and, and may improve the outcomes beyond what we can offer for a true idiopathic. But these were on an animal model and not on humans. So it's something to be considered that this is still in the research world, but not in, in prime time. And these were the outcomes. I took this screenshot from YouTube showing the nerves ablated and where they were um, in the, the rat model. One option that was experimented with and quickly abandoned was the laparoscopic denervation. The technique for this is that the gonadal artery and vein are taken with all the perivascular tissue. So likely they're going after the autonomic nerve fibers and this misses the peripheral nerve fibers completely. It wasn't stated in Dr. Kennedy's paper uh, from Hopkins whether they severed the genital femoral nerve fibers or not, uh, but presumably they didn't. But when you look at their success rate there, the rate of pain-free was zero in nine patients. They reported that 80% were improved and the rest were, they had no change in symptoms. But this was a follow-up of 25%, but the pain-free rate of zero is pretty dismal. So this option is really not an attractive one. And as I mentioned before, one of the mentors that I was fortunate to come upon at Hopkins and one person that has really changed my understanding of chronic pain and specifically neuropathic pain, was a peripheral nerve surgeon named Lee Dellen. And he led down the road, he was led down the road of peripheral nerve surgery when he was performing abdominoplasties. And when he performed the abdominoplasty, he noticed that patients with chronic pain were having relief of their pain. And we looked at why these patients were having relief. He identified the fact that he was transecting the ileoluminal iliohypogastric nerve and that those nerves were the reason for the pain conduction. So one system that he set up and has been instrumental in, in running at Hopkins and we're fortunate to have is that we have a musculoskeletal radiologist that can identify 
iliohypogastrogenital femoral nerve roots more proximate, closer to the nerve roots. So whenever we see these guys with pain in the distribution of an iliohypogastric iliohypogastric, and we want to confirm it, rather than doing a cord block, I'll send these patients over for an MRI guided nerve block. And that can identify the culprit nerve with much more accuracy. And if you can identify the nerve involved and have a confirmatory nerve block that shows that that nerve is in fact the one affected, then you can send these patients down the road of a neurectomy. So rather than taking all their spermatic cord structures and leaving the artery, leaving the vas, you can go in and just take out the ilioinguinal nerve or the iliohypogastric nerve. And these are pictures from the procedures that we performed together where we identified the ilioinguinal iliohypogastric nerve and we cauterized the proximal end of it and tucked it into the retroperitoneum. And also at the picture I showed before of the femoral nerve fiber, you can identify that as it exits the ring and transect it at that location as well. But when you look at the success rates of a neurectomy, and these are patients that have had chronic significant pain, the success rates for these patients is about 70 to 100%, depending on the study that you look at. Uh, Dellen and his colleague uh, Lee in 2000 showed 54 patients had 70% excellent relief. And then he's, his name pops up in a lot of these neurectomy studies where they again show 70 to 80% success rate. But when you consider this option of neurectomy, you, you can find, if you can find the nerve, then that gives you the option of so many more options. So just going down this road and having the nerves at the forefront of the thought process for what's causing the pain, you can send the patients for cryoablation of the nerve, RFA, neurectomy. So simply identifying the nerve has more implication than just doing a neurectomy. Identifying the nerve gives you a more targeted approach that will give you a higher likelihood of success than doing a kind of tour de force of the cord innervation where you're ablating all the nerves and hoping for a good outcome. One of the patients that I had taken care of and this option of, and this is actually how Dr. Lee Dellen and I crossed paths was with this patient. It was a patient that I had seen back in 2017 and he's a high functioning individual within Hopkins. They had come in with the presumptive diagnosis of IC since 2015. And his past surgical history was significant for right inguinal hernia repair. So drawing from what I learned from Dr. Moldwin at LIJ, there are trigger points. If you inject the trigger point, you can get a good response. And so I brought him in for a trigger point injection, what I thought was a trigger point injection. And he had previously been managed with Elmeron, 100 milligrams TIB, Flomax, Elville. And unfortunately, the Elville was really driving his quality work down and quality life down. And the psychotropic effects were really negative for him. So I brought him in for a right lower quadrant trigger point site injection. I did my 1% lidocaine. But for the 24 to 36 hour period after the injection, not only did he have benefit from his pain, but he also had significant reduction in absence really of any of his discomfort with bladder filling, his dysuria, frequency, urgency, and arterial all abated. And this was all a simple trigger point injection, at least what I thought was a trigger point injection. So in talking to some of my colleagues outside of urology to understand this better, I had a close friend who was in the plastic surgery department. And as soon as I said, anesthetic injected pain and urinary symptoms, he said, you must talk to Dr. Lee Dallin and, and ask him what he thinks and get his input since this is a, a VIP. And so by talking to him, he uh, led the patient down the road of nerve blocks. And sure enough, when we did the nerve blocks, the ileohypogastric iliohypogastrogenter femoral nerve block, and those were resected bilaterally and I'll explain why Dr. Dallin recommends that in a moment. The patient no longer has the need for Elevil. His dysuria is almost resolved and he continues to have mild LUTs, but he also had DPH and one Eurolift and that, that helped to reduce some of the symptoms. He has, the only residual symptom he has now is just some frequency urgency. But otherwise, the quality of life that he has now off of Elevil is significant. The reason that uh, Dr. Dellen had resected the ileohypogastric iliohypogastrogenital femoral nerve is that there are branches that will go between the iliohypogastrogenital to femoral nerves. And Dr. Dellen, even though the pain was on the right side, recommends that the nerves get resected bilaterally, is that he thinks that there is crossover of nerve signal uh, from left to right, right to the left. And so going after bilateral nerves is, a, is an option for him. Although from my experience, when I branched away and done these on my own, the unilateral nerve resection and selective nerve resection 
based on the nerve block has been more than adequate. But one of the things that came from this patient was the fact that in addition to his pain getting better, his urinary symptoms improved. And so one thing that we hypothesized was that perhaps at the T12 to L2 nerve roots, if you have a condition that leads to neuropathic pain, the spinal cord can't distinguish between these afferent signals going to the spinal cord from the peripheral nerves that feed into the same exit as the efferent that goes to the bladder, the afferents that come from the bladder. So whenever you have converging afferent signals from the bladder and you have efferents that go to the bladder, one concept that we hypothesized was that perhaps this is a reason for why some patients with peripheral nerve injuries have urinary symptoms and why you see presumptive diagnoses of interstitial cystitis, why you see some guys with chronic prostatitis related pain. And one of the other nerve fibers that we haven't proven, although we think similar problem is the pudendal nerve. So although the pudendal nerve inserts with its afferents at the S2 to S4, perhaps there's some overlap in the way that the cortex understands the merging of these signals. So this is ripe for future studying, but when we looked at the patients that have had been, they've carried the diagnosis of IC, but they also had a history of referred pain from T12 to L1 nerve root. Whenever these nerve roots were resected and they had the early renal early hypogastric nerves, their symptom scores for the puff and OSPI, which are urinary frequency pain questionnaires, significantly reduced. And this was at one week and it stayed at 10 months. So typically with pain studies, three months is a cutoff that you can expect a good outcome and expect that outcome to last. And here we have 10 month data, and this was recently published in the Gold Journal. And then as far as the vasectomy reversal option, this is something that I know Dr. Schlegel and Dr. Goldstein are, are key advocates of and have presented about. Now, when you look at the data for this, it, it, there is very good data, but you have to have it for a very select group of patients. They have to have focal pain after ejaculation, and they should ideally have congestive epididymides on exam. When you look at their success rates, about 30 to 70% of patients will be pain-free and 30 to 100% of patients will have improved pain. So there's a widespread for the outcomes. But when you look at the uh, groups that have studied these, Myers et al. has one of the larger studies looking at the success rates and they identified about three quarters of patients were either pain-free or improved and a quarter had no change. Eight of them had recurrences and six had a repeat reversal, all had bilateral vas reversal. And then when you look at Lee et al, who studied 22 patients, 70% of those were pain-free and 30% were improved. And when you look at the reduction in the pain in the VAS scales, they went from uh, six down to, um, they had a change, sorry, had a change of six versus a change of four when there was patency versus no patency. So the success rate of the reversal can impact the outcome of the pain, not surprisingly. So a limitation in a lot of these studies that they don't perform or don't report semen analyses to document that the anastomosis was patent. So we can see from this one study that patency of the vas reversal is extremely important and doing a technique that a microsurgical surgeon is comfortable with to ensure the best patency or referring to a microsurgical surgeon who can offer the best outcome is, is a good idea with this, especially considering the fact that the pain uh, differs between the patency. And as a last resort should be orchiectomy. Whenever you look at the success rates of a scrotal versus inguinal orchiectomy, the rate of pain-free after a scrotal orchiectomy is about 50%. And when you look at the number improved, 30% will be improved and the number not changed, 22%. But when you look at the rate of pain-free after an inguinal orchiectomy, the success rate jumps to three quarters of a percent, uh, sorry, 70%. And the rate of improved is also better. And one reason for this is that as you go more proximal along the nerve roots and you're doing the orchiectomy at a higher location, you're transecting more nerve fibers prior to their branching. So you'll catch more of the ilioinguinal nerve fibers, you'll potentially catch some more of the autonomic nerve fibers. And this is an important consideration when offering patients orchiectomy is the location and preferentially it should be inguinal. But what do you do about the patient that has persistence of pain or what can you say about their pain if they have persistence after an inguinal or scrotal orchiectomy? Again, uh, Dr. Dellen's name pops up here and though he's not a urologist, 
he identified 10 patients who had undergone prior hernia repair, vasectomy, prostatectomy, or epididymectomy, and had an orchiectomy with persistence of pain. So they had six months of squirrel pain after orchiectomy. Three of them were suicidal. One had a spinal cord stimulator placed and removed due to lack of benefit. And what Dr. Dillon identified was a missed genital branch in all of them. So when he resected the genital femoral nerve branch in these patients, 80% of them had excellent relief and two had good relief with a mean follow-up of 17 months. So when considering an orchiectomy, if, if one must go after the testis and remove it as a final option, it's really important to take the testis and to look at the nerve fibers in the area as well. So simply doing an orchiectomy and neglecting the nerve fibers can lead to a persistence of pain and and these guys can be suicidal in their uh, thoughts. So it's important. So in conclusion, it is a challenging condition, but very few of them are truly idiopathic. And if you think about the distribution of referred pain, if you really hone in on the exam and take a step back and break with the thought process that these are difficult patients and you must get them out of your clinic as soon as possible, you can identify a lot of guys with very treatable, simple to treat conditions, such as epidemicis. One must consider causes outside the scrotum and common GU sources. So as I mentioned, the uh, spinal and the sacral nerve roots, whatever <laughs> we're considering those areas, you must take those into consideration whenever patients have negative cord blocks, negative nerve blocks, and they have a, a pain that is exacerbated by back flexion. So whenever you identify that there are symptoms outside of the GU system, but with referring pain and doing a, a cord innervation, doing an orchiectomy is not going to result in, in pain-free or even improved pain. They have persistence of pain, and they're going to be upset that they lost a testicle over it. So some things to think about. Thank you so much for your attention, and I appreciate your questions. I mean, that was great. Um, can I ask you real quick? So in that last, last uh, case presentation you had, was that the... When, when you said that uh, the Dr. Dillon identified the genital femoral branch was still intact, was that an example of the, the use of musculoskeletal radiology that you mentioned earlier? Is that how they were able to identify it? Yeah, so he, before he does an orchiectomy in any patient, he has them go through an MRI guided nerve block. Now, in some cases where they don't have access to Hopkins and they can't utilize the resources, then ultrasound guided is adequate for his purposes. <clears throat> but this is something that we see so reproducibly that when I see patients with post orchiectomy pain, I know that this is the, the key driver of the pain. So by history, it's very reproducible. Confirmation wise, you can con confirm it before operating. And I always recommend that just so patients don't get unnecessary surgery. On a parallel note, I mean, First of all, that was a great talk, and particularly your emphasis on understanding from the patients on history and physical exam, really what is going on and what the predisposing triggers were. Going back to follow up on Jim's question, you know, do you follow up or do you use MRI beyond looking for spinal pathology to track these nerves? I know that, you know, post hernia repair people are able to track the nerves and see entrapment pretty well. Are there other cases where that is helpful to you at all? And so exactly you know, what you mentioned. In some cases, we can see a hyperintense signal from the nerve, but not in all cases. So a, a simple, so we, what we use is a three Tesla MRI and we have an MR neurography protocol that we use with our radiologists and they can identify neuropathic changes with some accuracy. But the MRI is not sufficient by itself as the identifier of where the pain is coming from. But in some cases, we do see it. The cases that we see more often are more of the pudendal neuropathies. So patients that have pelvic floor dysfunction, if you get an MRI then you may incidentally find that their pudendal nerve is hyperintense on MRI. But it, it doesn't really change my recommendations. If the problem is a correctable condition like pelvic floor dysfunction, I'm still going to send them down the road of pelvic floor physical therapy, and we have some other treatment options out there for pelvic floor dysfunction. But I, I'll go for that first. I won't recommend neuropathic treatments just by identifying them on signal changes. Now, you mentioned that, you know, if you do a neurectomy for a genital femoral, 
branch, you tend to do that at the level of the external ring. Was that correct? Correct. Where do they do, or at what level do they do the ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerve blocks or neurectomy? A great question. So the location Dellen performs his ilioinguinal, iliohypogastric neurectomy is two finger breaths medial, two finger breaths below ASIS. I reproducibly cannot find those nerves and I've done cadaver models and I've tried on patients and I've had to make a second incision along the inguinal canal to identify the ilioinguinal nerve. The iliohypogastric sits between the internal oblique and the transverse and going between those muscle and fascial planes, it's easy to misinterpret a nerve fiber for fascia, for muscle branches. And what looks like a nerve fiber, and that's why I'm excited by the multi-photon microscopy, is that if you can have something that lights those nerves up, you can identify the nerve with better accuracy. And maybe at that point, I'll go back to ASIS. But typically for patients with ilioinguinal nerve, I'll go along the inguinal canal, and I'll make a more proximal inguinal canal incision to find the nerve there. But the iliohypogastric is about probably two to three centimeters above the ilioinguinal nerve and runs parallel towards the suprapubic area. Yeah. I mean, hi, this is Dory. Later, Clem. Yeah. Um, so I have a quick question. You know, um, so one of our genes, actually several of our genes we identified for GU birth defects also uh, cause neural tube defects, right? Um, and, um, and so then that hooked me up with a, a man who's expert in spina bifida um, uh, on, on the molecular basis, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm wondering, uh, because, you know, uh, occult spina bifida is now being associated with some cases of, say, uh, incontinence occurring, you know, midlife and even older and some of these pelvic pain syndromes. So I'm wondering, do you, would you be able to see that on, on your imaging that you're doing? And uh, what is your thought about sort of a more uh, central cause of this in these intractable cases? Thank you so much for that question. I know you and I had talked about that in the past. The slide that I showed early on, I'm not sure if I can click to it quickly, but the, it was early on in my evaluation management showing the anatomy and the nerve root. So this is where that would have the interface between the, the spinal dysgraphism and the pain and something that we probably don't appreciate enough of, but I think the MRI would identify these guys. But when you see that the nerve roots are affected, either their perineural sheath is affected with a cyst or there's compression or herniation of the uh, epineuroses, then that can lead to uh, pain and urinary symptom changes. So I think the spina bifida population and neural tube defect patient population, having the, the symptoms of urinary symptom pain makes a lot of sense considering the data that we have from patients with neuropathic pain and alleviation of their uh, urinary symptoms associated. So we're just showing in different ways. So when you have the neural tube defect patients, they have the complex they have the same set of symptoms, the same complex of symptoms. And when you consider patients with neuropathic pain, very similar. So I haven't seen it. I'm sure with enough time, I, I probably will find a patient with an occult and neural tube defect that hadn't been diagnosed. Okay, because yeah. you know, it's 10% of people walking around apparently have this occult spina bifida. So it's not uncommon. And you know, my sense was that maybe you could have a small defect right, that is not so perhaps immediately apparent, but causing an isolated, you know, effect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, yeah. I, I haven't seen it, but I'm sure I will. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's definitely, it's out there. Those patients are out there. One, one other condition that I, I didn't present on just out of the interest of time. Yeah. Actually, I'll, I'll hold off. I think that's a, a whole kettle of fish that I, I mean one thing to. I mean, you talked about um, Wallerian degeneration as being a marker for nerve damage. Have you gone back retrospectively and looked at those patients where you resected their nerves and compared that finding um, mm -hmm. to relief of pain? We So I have, and that's something that we, anytime we have a, a patient with a mechanism where there's a high likelihood or it's not clear why the patient developed pain, 
then we'll send the nerve for trichrome stain to see if they can identify evidence of learning degeneration. And every time it's been negative. So we've had patients that have had TURPs with pudental neuropathy and perineal nerve branches resected with pain-free. We've had patients with brachytherapy, again, with pudendal nerve irritation and their nerves were negative. These patients that I resect iliolingual nerve on, no evidence, despite entrapment of hernia. So a lot of these guys are coming in with very reproducible pain treatment. They do a great willing degeneration isn't seen. So I know it exists. I mean, I, I believe Dr. Perifteel's data, but I just can't explain why we're not seeing it on our stains and why he was. So that's one of the things that I think is a limitation is that he is supporting his microsurgical denervation approach by showing that there are changes that he can identify, but I'm not convinced that those nerves are the culprit nerves. For all we know, this could just be a, a red herring and just an, a, a nerve that degenerated. But who's to say that that nerve was the one that led to the pain? Yeah, thanks. That's an interesting concept. Um, so the final question, when I think about cysts in the epididymis, I think about cysts that are either derived from lymphatics or derived from kind of the collecting system or efferent ductuli, which are sort of by definition spermatoceles. Do you see a difference in terms of the frequency of one or the other being these painful epididymal cysts that you identify and resect? I haven't seen a difference between them and success rates. I think any fluid filled sac in a confined space will cause pain. And taking them out. So I'm not sure if it's the cyst excision that's helping or when I take out the cyst, I'm opening the tunic albuginea over the epididymis. And if that's the reason for the pain relief. So it may be a combination. Maybe as I'm resecting the epididymal cyst, that's treating it. But you know, thinking back to my tar, to my cyst, my vulvar wrist cyst decompression that cyst was all that was needed. So perhaps putting a needle in to aspirate out the cyst to see if that alleviates the pain could be a diagnostic step that could identify these complex patients that are between orchiectomy, cord innervation, epididymal cyst surgery. Although I'd argue epididymal cyst surgery is a very simple option to offer with a high rate of success. So it's kind of a no brainer to try if you can identify the, the cyst as the, the side of pain. I would just caution, particularly for the residents, epididymal cysts are very commonly seen on ultrasound. And Dr. Harati's point of making sure that the cyst is the site of pain is really critical. Absolutely, yeah. And I've, I've pulled my data together. I haven't published it or presented it anywhere, but sub-centimeter cysts are, can be very painful. So I've had patients that the ultrasound did not identify the cyst but I could reproduce it on exam. I've had patients with three millimeter cysts that were dismissed by other colleagues and other providers saying that that cyst is too small to cause pain. I would say that there's really no size criteria that says that this cyst will cause pain, this one won't. You can see guys with three centimeter spermatoceles and they have a dull ache. But why does that one cause a dull ache and why does the three millimeter one cause intense pain? Great points. I think, I think, you know, going, going back to what Peter is saying, I mean, you know, when you think about, again, as a, as a person who doesn't see these conditions or rarely sees them, uh, of course, there's the old saying that, um, you know, you operate on pain, you get pain, right? And so, so which I'm sure you've heard. So the question is, how, how do you go from, you know, and, and again, I, this is a very enlightening talk for me. And I, and I think Peter's emphasis on on treating things that are affirmed by physicals, history physicals and radiologic findings and, and the careful blocks that you're doing beforehand. So what do you think the field needs to do? And because I think obviously there's a lot of potential for funding here, right? Like multi-center studies, randomized controlled trials, because you need you need that higher level evidence, of course, in order to change guidelines and say, well, what, 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 what should we do and what's the diagnostic and therapeutic pathway? Absolutely, there's so many hypotheses that can come from thinking about these patients. And, and one thing I'll say is, uh, you know, pain begets pain. I, I, get, I think pain begets cherry pies. <laughs> when you consider the condition and you identify the condition that's causing pain, you treat that pain, the pain goes away. You get eternally grateful patients. And I've had so many patients cry in my clinic because of their pain. And then once I give them hope that there's a treatment out there, they 
are beyond elated. They, you've given their life back to them. And just by simply palpating the system, they're up to them saying, that's treatable, that's fixable. You don't need to have your testicle removed for this. So I think that we as a field need to go away from thinking if, about conditions as, A, we need to stop worrying about these patients as complex, difficult patients. There are a subset of them that are drug seeking that have secondary motives, but I would say that's not the majority of them. The majority of these guys have a condition. They can have an identifiable source of their pain a lot of times, and those patients can be treated. So the key takeaway for me is that these patients are out there, they're identifiable. Regarding what we need to do as a field, we probably need to look outside of our wheelhouse of treatment options. We need to think beyond the denervation. We need to think beyond of conditions within the scrotum and open our minds to things outside. Now, I was fortunate to be here at Hopkins and work with the people that I worked with. Otherwise, this whole concept of neuropathic pain was something that I turned a blind eye to because it wasn't in my training. It wasn't something that I thought about. But having people like Lee Dellen and Hopkins who challenged me to think more about the nerves more proximally and identify these nerves more proximally led me to reassess my understanding of the anatomy of the scrotum. So I think there's an, an educational piece to it, which is I really appreciate that you guys invited me here to, to, be able to be able to deliver that message. As far as future studies that can come from this, I think there are a lot of guys out there, a lot of women out there who have peripheral nerves as a reason for their IC or as a reason for their pelvic pain. And studying these patients and, and looking at the data to look back at the MAP studies and see how many of these patients were misclassified. And I've talked to members of the MAP study, Rob Moldman specifically, to see if they looked at this. I mean, this was not in their uh, purview to look at. So that this is something they were looking for. And, and I think that there are a number of patients out there that have a very correctable cause of their IC as well and can save these patients from Elmeron and all the secondary effects of Elmeron and improve their quality of life with just a simple one hour procedure. So I think that taking a step back and looking at the map data again may be a good idea. Looking at how the brain interprets these signals from peripheral nerves, from no pedendal, even autonomic nerve fibers and how it misinterprets those as bladder signal is ripe for study. So there's so many avenues that can come from this. That's great. Victor, did you have a, I see you, you, you turned on your screen. So presumably you got a question. I, I do have a question. Yeah. Good morning, Dr. Harati. That was a yeah. fascinating talk. Thank you. I'm a postdoc in uh, Dory's lab and kind of have a, a follow-up question. You mentioned at the beginning kind of the importance of doing the, the history write-up, and I'm curious um, when doing that, if there's evidence in the literature that uh, of scrotal pain being caused by having cryptorchidism much earlier on and sort of something related to the cryptorchidism arising in adulthood, you know, around 40 or so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Certainly one can come up with a couple of theories about why they would be at risk for having orchalgia after cryptorchidism namely whenever they have the procedure to bring the testis down to orchiopex, they can have nerve entrapment along the inguinal canal. I don't think there's anything intrinsic to undescended testis that would lead them to testicular pain though. There's nothing in the biology of cryptorchidism that would lead directly to it, but it's gonna be more in the procedures to repair it that would put people at risk. Thank you. Well, I mean, thanks so much. This is great. Um, maybe you'll be getting a stream of patients coming down to Baltimore with a lot of pain there. And uh, we'll see Happy them come back. More cherry pies from New York City. <laughs> great. All right. Thank you so much. It's great to, great to hear from you. Likewise. Thanks. Thank you for having me. Thanks, Amin. I just want to remind everybody, you can get CME credit by clicking on the links that Tanya sent out Thursday, March 4th at 4.19 p.m. Hopefully we'll have that set up in a simpler way just uh, to get your CME credits. Thanks again, Amin. Thank you. Bye, Amin. Bye-bye.